So our speakers today are Kamina weasel Moccasin and Chris Hodgson-Bright, who will speak on the 153rd um, year old Battle of the Belly River. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about Kamina and Chris. So Kamina weasel Moccasin is a member of the Kainai Nation and part of the Many Children Clan. She is currently one of the curators at the Galt Museum and Archives and has been in her role for the past year. In addition to her museum work, Kamina is also pursuing a master's degree in anthropology at the University of Lethbridge, all while raising her two small children who are five and three. For the past decade, Kamina has worked tirelessly at redeveloping institutional policies to better support Mitsitipi traditional and ceremonial practices. And Chris Hodgson Bright, our other presenter, is an instructor in the Digital Communications and Media Program and Multimedia Production Diploma Programs and has been a writer and photographer for various publications across Western Canada for the last 16 years. The completion of work on his master's degree in virtual reality, 360 degree journalism, from the University of Alberta in the Communication and Technology Program, kickstarted a uh, his applied research opportunities at Lethbridge College surrounding the ever-evolving world of journalism and immensive storytelling. So please welcome Chris and Kamina. Uh, so as Marnie had mentioned, I'm from the Kainai Nation. I'm part of the Many Children's Clan. And I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to work on this project, uh, which is focuses on the Battle of the Belly River that happened uh, just in our river valley here back in 1870. Okay. Um, so... A big impetus behind this project and the reason why we felt that it was worthy to, to take on um, is that we feel that this project um, highlighting this fight that happened between the Blackfoot people and a group of Crees back in October of 1870. Um, and so one thing that has kind of come out through this research um, that was known about before is that it was a a smaller group of people that were Cree, but as they moved over to, into the West, there were other groups, a uh, smaller group from an Assiniboine that had joined them as well, and another another group. So it wasn't entirely Cree. Um, and through, there's been three previous publications about this event, um, but for the most part, all three of those publications talk about this event largely from the settler colonial perspective. And so, with this project happening now in 2023, uh, starting in 2022, we wanted to really highlight the Nitsitibi knowledge and voices around this project um, and this event. It's something that, as I've gone through, um, it's really opened my eyes to the different cultural understandings behind this one event, but also the reasoning behind the outcome of the event, and I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit here. Um, so right now we're, we're really working with uh, the three Blackfoot nations here in Canada. Um, there, again, through the research that we've done, we've been told that there was a small group of Amskabi um, Bikani that were here when this battle had taken place. Um, but as of right now, just because they are south of the border, we're really focusing our attention on these three communities here. <coughs> Um, and so far, the, the engagements that we've had with um, the Kainai and the Bigani communities, um, they are very supportive of this project and very forthcoming in wanting to share the stories that they do have. Um, so just really brief uh, about myself, again, the tribe and the clan that I'm from. Um, I've actually been involved with heritage management for the past 15 years. And I have work experience at both uh, Riding on Stone is Snake and Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump. Um, I've worked with their interpretation programs at both of those sites. Currently a curator for the Galt Museum, um, and as mentioned, a master student at the U of L, 
And my master's research really focuses on the heritage education programs at Riding on Stone and Head Smashton. And what I'm really looking at is what the, the policy documents say and how the, um, the heritage education is going to be communicated and how that actually compares to what the Blackfoot community feels should be communicated. Is there discrepancies, discrepancies there and why might that be? Um, so at this point, I'm going to pass the torch over to my co-presenter here. Thanks, Kamina, uh, and hello, everybody. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be involved in this project. Um, and uh, my background is uh, as journalism, as you heard. And so uh, during this process, it's been amazing that I actually... Um, there was a whole ceremony where I was given the Blackfoot name. So um, Coyote Singer is, is that name, but I cannot say it in Blackfoot. So <laughs> um, that's as much as I could write, because I probably either spell it wrong or say it wrong. So I've been at the college for the last 11 years, and uh, it, it's been a lot of fun to be involved in various projects, and, and this one has been the most meaningful for sure. And I've really been working with Kamina to make sure that um, we... Uh, proceed at, uh, in the right direction and with the right guidance to make sure this is a very thoughtful and kind project that really takes all those perspectives from the Blackfoot people into consideration and make sure that, again, we present it in a way that's very thoughtful and meaningful. So, yeah, I've been in the college for 11 years. Uh, I teach in both uh, digital communication and media and multimedia production. And, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, those, those classes and programs are, are very creative, very dynamic, uh, a lot of excitement uh, every week uh, about the various projects that students are working on, and the semester actually wraps up tomorrow, so uh, I'm very happy about that. I'm sure the students are too. Um, yeah, and then yeah, I did a, a master's at the uh, U of A a few years ago, looking at immersive storytelling, and so uh, what was really neat is that at Lethbridge College, I was part of a, a committee where we were looking at the best ways to move forward with truth and reconciliation at Lethbridge College. And so uh, this committee had uh, Perry Stein from the city of Lethbridge on it. And so it was his idea, it's his fault, that he got me involved in this project because he said, hey, we're doing this really cool thing you should be involved. Because uh, we started throwing around the ideas of 360 uh, degree storytelling, virtual reality, augmented reality, all of those things. I'm like, oh, cool. This sounds like a lot of fun. Um, so from that, um, so it's the college. And, and so the perspective that I bring in is this idea of immersive storytelling. And so um, we'll get to it a little bit later on. But it was back in October, we had a face-to-face -face discussion with two elders. Um, Peter Weasel Moccasin and Mike Brewstead, and so they told the story in, uh, at Fort Whipup to a group of Indigenous Career Pathway students, and so that was very special. It was about a three-hour uh, story that they shared, and just to be part of that storytelling was impressive, and so the question that we're looking at through this is uh, taking that traditional storytelling style and then looking at does it have a place or a home with virtual reality? So that was the whole kind of impetus around this. Uh, we've received funding from the province. Um, so through the province of Alberta, cultural heritage funding has helped expand kind of the scope of this project, which is really exciting. Uh, Lethbridge Historical Society, and George Cool is here representing the society today. And it's been uh, impressive to have uh, all of their feedback and consideration to this project too. And they have an amazing publication if you haven't seen it at the Gulf Museum already. Uh, but really looking at how we can build on that knowledge. And then the city of Lethbridge, of course, um, through uh, Ross Kilgore and uh, a couple other individuals who have really helped to, um, again, highlight why the story is so important to not only the city, but this region and to our country. Uh, and then obviously the work that Kamina is doing at the Galt has been uh, incredible and it's, it's been an honor to work with her. So. Uh, I'll pass it over back to Kamina. So just a really quick review of kind of the progress that we've had to date. Um, so far, I've had the wonderful opportunity to sit down with 10 elders. Um, and there's actually more that are still interested in sharing. 
So one of the things that um, I have been doing is I've been attending Bigani Elder Meetings since September. Um, so in the Bigani community, every Tuesday, the elders come together, they have a meal, they share information and just get to visit. Um, so I've committed myself to attending one meeting a month and just um, part of that relationship building, but also reminding them we got this really great project. Um, anybody that does have stories and that's one of the things that um, I guess a, a broader understanding from the, the previous publications is that this story is both a collective story for the tribes but there's also individual stories so families and individuals who were involved in this event um, they then have those personal experiences that are then handed down in the families. And so those are some of the stories that we are really trying to capture. <coughs> um, and so just so far with the stories that we have heard from elders, um, some of the themes that I've seen come out from that, there's been quite a few people that talk about, oh, my Blackfoot name is this, and it actually comes from that battle because this story happened with one of my ancestors. So that's a really neat thing that I've been thinking about, um, I guess, in the future. We've also talked about this project being two phases. So right now we're in phase one, which is basically just engaging with the community, seeing how many stories we can get. Uh, by next year, we'll start moving into phase two, which is then we got all of this great content. What do we want to do with it? Um, so kind of already thinking about phase two, I'm thinking, okay, if we have a publication, this would be a really interesting section in that publication that just highlights Blackfoot names that came from this event. Um, another thing, as I had mentioned, kind of alluded to earlier, is that with the previous publications, they talked about the victory of this event being um, the, the weapons that the Blackfoot people had had. They had already had access to the repeating rifle, and that was something that... Um, a greater technology than the musket gun that the Cree and the other group had had. But in talking with elders, that's never really brought up as the reason that the victory had happened for the Blackfoot people. Um, a lot of the stories that I'm hearing, the reason that the victory had happened is actually spiritual reasons and the spiritual connection that Blackfoot people have. So one story talked about a Blackfoot elder actually dreaming of the people coming and so kind of put everybody on alert something might be happening over the next few nights be ready keep your horses close to your camp um, there's another story that as the battle is happening there's one Cree person that's taunting the Blackfoot and the Blackfoot can't shoot at them their bullets just keep missing and so they identify one young boy in the group and tell them okay you you smoke this pipe and then you shoot them and so that young boy smokes the pipe and then he's able to, to give this person uh, basically a kill shot. Um, so there's all of those great things coming out that for me, um, being a Blackfoot researcher, really wanting to bring that to the forefront of this research. Um, some of the lingering questions that I continue to have about this, um, and it's usually one of my critiques about um, the traditional way of looking at history, is my big question, okay, well, where are the women and children? What are they doing when all of this is happening? And again, I've heard a, a, a few stories that have come through. Um, a really interesting one is in my family, we have a story about my great-great-grandmother. Uh, one of the Cree had come into the camp, uh, in, actually into the teepee, and she had a butcher knife under her pillow, and so that she was able to stab him in the neck and save her and her children. Now, months later, I'm sitting in Bigani with the elders, and one of the elders comes forward and says, my Blackfoot name is Kills First, and it comes from this battle. And I'm not entirely sure what the story is, but one of my great-great-grandmother's ancestors had actually made the first kill. And so the next meeting I went to, I told my dad, can you come with me to this meeting? He came with me again. This woman had mentioned this story. My dad, they start conversing in Blackfoot and find out that she is actually one of our relatives and that she's talking about my great-grandmother that my dad has the story about. So he shared the story with her and she was really grateful and said, thank you so much. I'm glad that now I know the full story behind my name. So hopefully as we enter into phase two, we actually have some, some tangible um, exhibit stuff that we can then share with the community. 
Um, a couple of ideas that have kind of been floated around is an exhibit in the museum. Uh, another one is possibly a walking tour. We're looking at what types of school programs can be created from the content that we have. Uh, really looking at all the different ways that we can package this material and make it accessible to people in the community. And pass to Chris. Okay. All right. Yeah, so the community has been doing this amazing work and uh, it, it's been really fascinating just to hear all these stories as I start to look at these audio transcripts of, of those conversations. But uh, so then the, the applied research kind of aspect from the college uh, and just that kind of ties into my master's work because I was looking at how does immersive technology fit into traditional uh, indigenous storytelling and so uh, that's really the question and so there's focus groups that have happened we've had one so far at the end of March and then there will be another uh, couple at the end of May we're asking that question then really to make sure that again does it make sense to tell stories this way Will young people like to engage in hearing about stories about their ancestors and the history of the Blackfoot culture through virtual reality? Or what I've heard already through some of the initial focus groups, it's much more special when you're sitting there in that TV listening to the elders and you hear it face to face. So that's, that's been really interesting to hear. Um, so here are photos, if you can see from the back here, but uh, both uh, Peter Weasel Moccasin and Mike Brewshead. So uh, Minipuka and uh, Nina Pixi are their Blackfoot names. Uh, and so they're uh, very, uh, it was incredible to hear how they shared the story. Again, three hours they took the time with us back at the end of October on the actual anniversary of the battle. So uh, October was 152 years ago. And so that was very special that we could do it on that day at that time and, uh, and for them to, to share that story at that time. So these are some photos from that day. Um, there's the, the teepee at Fort Whipup. Here are some of the Indigenous Career Pathway students who are listening to, the, to Peter and Mike in the teepee. And then they're gathered around the table there in the top left. And then Kamina's uh, getting interviewed by the press there in the bottom left. And so just like there's many phases to this project from the college's perspective or from my perspective, so these focus groups are happening uh, looking at people experiencing, experiencing the story in virtual reality, um, we make sure everybody sits down so they don't get disoriented or dizzy because even my wife can't stand to have one of these headsets on for very long. So, um, And uh, I'll pass this back to Kamina. Uh, so one of the things that I really appreciate in working with Chris is that um, constantly having the opportunity to, to interject, <laughs> uh, to, to provide ideas and, you know, what if we try this? Or maybe um, maybe this is something that we can work into the, the virtual reality experience. Um, so again, for me, making sure that the women in our community, their voices are being heard, that their presence is, is known as well. Um, and so one of the things I had suggested to Chris was including uh, these two beautiful women into the project um, so on the left there we have a dancer, um, Edna Bad Eagle, and she's actually one of the um, uh, the program coordinator at the Opagossin Early Intervention Society, and she is a traditional dancer. For me, it was really important to have um, this style of traditional dance, women's traditional dance, um, involved in this project because the dance itself is meant to honor warriors. And so this was something that elders had mentioned was that when the men would come back from a war raid, the women would stand outside and they would dance as their way to honor what these men had done and that they were able to make it back home. Um, so for me, it's like, it just makes sense that we have a traditional dancer involved in this program or in, in this project um, since it's really focused on the battle and, and the warriors. Um, and then we also have um, Elder Shirley Croshu, uh, Misamins, sorry, Misam Iniskim. Um, and she's actually narrating the content for the VR program. Um, again, a lot of the, the stories very uh, male focused um, and wanting to have kind of contradict that by having a female narrate some of these events. Um, 
<laughs> and one of the things I love about, she's got a very distinctive, lovely voice. Um, Chris was mentioning that a student heard the recording and right away was like, that's Shirley. <laughs> uh, so yeah, just, just a lovely voice to have as part of the project. All right, so here's a couple photos here of uh, the first focus group. So again, you can see people are sitting down, so safety first. Um, and what's really neat is that uh, because if anybody's tried virtual reality, you usually have to do a lot of, of finagling and trying to like move within the scene. Uh, the alumni of uh, the virtual reality certificate program at Lethbridge College helped to design this. So I wish I had these kind of skills, but I don't. So I've just hired the right people. Um, and so they've created a really great immersive experience where very little interaction is needed to experience that story and move it along. So uh, that's, that's really uh, special. And so um, this is the feedback so far that I've gathered from uh, the end of March, uh, Marcia Blackwater is the instructor in the Indigenous Certificate Program here, and those are some of her students uh, at Lethbridge College, so they were providing some really rich feedback, and so I really look forward to all these conversations that are happening kind of peripherally through this project have been just as important as like as the program or the, the project evolved, so that's been really great. Um, here are a couple of the alumni who are working on the project, and one that didn't make the cut is Miranda Hubbard. So. Uh, she's been volunteering and she's an alumni of both the programs that I've taught in, uh, which is really special. And she just kind of said, hey, what are you guys doing? I'd love to be involved. And so she's been uh, amazing and she's actually doing some game design at Lethbridge College. And then um, in addition to the work that she's doing, so Daniel Ruiz Leva, uh, he's out in Toronto actually now. So the beauty of this project is that we have somebody in Toronto, somebody in Saskatoon, and then we have somebody in Lethbridge all working on this project together. Um, and so, um, so Daniel has a degree in uh, biology and a master's degree in computer science, so he loves that virtual reality is like this perfect match of his interests in science outreach, computer uh, graphics and programming. And he said it was an excellent opportunity to apply skills while learning about Alberta's cultural heritage. And then uh, Rick or Richard Pat, he's a, also an XR developer and artist. He's from Clarison, but now he's living in Saskatoon. Um, and he's working in digital media, mostly using Blender and Unity, which are the two programs. And so any chance I can, I'm promoting these two because they're wanting to work on additional projects. So I, I said I'd promote them as much as I could. So um, if you're looking for any virtual reality work, there you go. Um, and then what's really great, again, about uh, this project uh, is that there's been, I've, I've counted as many as 34 people have contributed in various ways to this project and that's not even including all the people that Community has spoke with. So again, that collaboration, the idea of working together to try and find a really amazing way to tell this story moving forward. Uh, and again, you've, you've seen all the, uh, the logos at the beginning. We actually also made a trip out to Medicine Hat because they had some art artifacts uh, there at the Esplanade uh, that we were able to take photos of as well. And these are a couple of them. So on the left here, this is a teepee that we found that actually has uh, inscriptions and um, drawings of what actually transpired with the battle. Um, so that's on the left-hand side there. And then on the right-hand side is a war shirt from the battle. And so, uh, again, what was neat is that uh, there's a practice called photogrammetry, which is taking about 100 photos of an artifact and turning it into a digital artifact, so then we don't have to uh, worry about damaging these original artifacts, but you can have a digital piece that you can man manipulate, but change, rotate 360 degrees, zoom in, zoom out, check the kind of material that was involved, as well as have some uh, labels to identify various parts of these artifacts. So that's been really cool and uh, uh, an element that I'm really excited about with the future of journalism and looking at, again, photogrammetry and that power of having actual artifacts while you are reading about some kind of story. Uh, and this is a photo that uh, was taken of both Kamina and I while we were at the Esplanade. So she has one of the original artifacts here that she's handling and then I'm taking photos of it. And then what was nice is that we had essentially like a lazy Susan. Um, sorry to anybody named Susan. <laughs> but just like a rotating table that was able to capture this object so we didn't have to touch it as much so that we can get it from all different angles. Um, and then 
this, I don't know if you can see with the lights in here, but this is actual a scene from the virtual reality um, interaction where you can actually pick up all of these artifacts off a table and you can actually hold them in your hand while you're in virtual reality and examine them and they're a complete replica uh, of what happened. And there's somebody that's super talented at Lethbridge College as well that they've 3D printed, so Jesse Sorensen, they 3D printed from these digital artifacts so then and then they painted the actual colors of those artifacts. So I have small miniature versions of these artifacts that are on my desk at the college. I should have brought them today uh, to show you. But uh, again, a really neat way to interact with some of these, uh, these amazing artifacts. Um, So as mentioned, we've kind of talked about different ideas of how we can provide this um, information back into the community. And so one of them being um, audio narration of the, the knowledge keepers and the elders that have so far shared their perspectives and their voices. Um, as mentioned, kind of a walking tour in the river valley. A virtual reality experience of the Battle of the Belly River, which is what Chris has kind of been talking about. Um, and then as part of his project, he's also taken drone footage of some of the Blackfoot sacred sites. So riding on Sona Sinek and head smashed in Buffalo Jump. Um, and these are things that are going to be incorporated into the program. Again, really just to highlight that, that connection to the landscape, that spiritual connection, um, and how actually visiting some of these sites um, is, is related to like traditional warfare and, and for traditional warriors trying to go out. Um, that's one of the, the traditional uses of riding on Stony Sinek was to travel through that area and look at the rock art and what does the rock art going to tell us about our journey? Are we going to be successful or not? Um, and then, as he had mentioned, uh, some of the, the 3D artifacts that we have, um, have with us and that finding ways to showcase those. So um, the drone footage is, it's absolutely beautiful. It's a great way to experience this landscape. Um, and for myself as a person who has very intimately interacted with both of these landscapes, um, seeing, seeing the drone footage, uh, it is really interesting for me. It almost gives it a, um, not sure of the right word, a surreal or almost a spiritual way of journeying through that landscape where you are basically flying through, you're looking down, and that's um, a perspective that you're not going to get when you're actually in, in that place. It would be pretty mm -hmm. surreal. <laughs> yeah, just by its nature it is. <laughs> um, so some of our project goals thus far, um, again, hoping to amplify those voices, really bringing, um, connecting Indigenous students and elders together, but also connecting them with the past. So this really interesting uh, time loop thing, I guess, that, that that's kind of occurring as, as we work through this. Um, so connecting with the elders in the most culturally respective ways. Um, so some of the comments that I have gotten from the community is well, you, if you're looking for these stories from elders, you need to make sure you're approaching them in the appropriate way. And that's one thing that I, we've always tried to keep at the forefront. Um, that's basically the core of our methodology as we move through this project, is always reverting back to, okay, what's, what's the appropriate way to go about this? Um, even what are appropriate questions to ask or not to ask? And really, I think a big part of this project, a really great outcome of this project, is really going to be empowering um, Indigenous people and communities in that sharing our stories from our how we come to understand them. Um, it's one thing to pick up a book and, and to read it. It's another thing to sit with an elder. Um, there's a term that we have in Blackfoot that basically says, put, put me in the story. And so when you sit down with an elder, you tell them that. And so it, they're, they really are immersing you um, in, in the discussions that they have. And that's everything? Yeah. Okay. That's it. Uh, so next week's uh, speaker uh, is Tanya Stilson on the topic of medical, um, I'm probably saying that wrong. Sorry if I did. Uh, assistance in dying. So um, now we're gonna get to our question and answer session. 
So we ask those uh, who are asking questions, if you want to line up along the wall, it looks like over here, uh, please state your name when you get to the podium and um, ask your question briefly. So no long preludes or stories, please. Which seems a little ironic because we're talking about story time. <laughs> so we, we, we uh, expect respectful and polite discourse, of course. And if you prefer to write, your question, feel free in the legible, written, and signed. Um, so we asked, so so I can ask you to come up and or and I'll read it for you, if that's easier for you. So, do we have? Here we go. First question. <coughs> So that's a really interesting thing again um, initially with the the publications that were done they were very um, geographically focused and very time focused in that they were just talking about the event on this one day that happened within this certain area within um, the river bottom but as I sat down with elders a lot of times when I say okay you know share any stories with the battle um, a large majority of the time they say okay well before that even happened, you need to know that this had happened. So there's actually a very long history of animosity between um, Cree and Blackfoot groups. And it, it's a very complex history in that there were, there were also intermarriages that happened. So you might have a Cree clan and a Blackfoot clan that are considered allies, but if that Blackfoot clan meets with another Cree clan, then they could fight. So it's very complex, um, but there's a very long history of animosity between these two groups. And so this is happening at a time where there's a lot of disease, there's a lot of starvation, um, the bison are, are dwindling very quickly, and now all of a sudden we got this new technology of the gun and the horse, right? So that there was a lot of um, animosity and a lot of turmoil that was happening on the land with the, the traditional groups at that time. And so this was one of the things where um, you know, the Cree group, having stress of, you know, our, our people are dying, there's a lot of disease, we're not having food, now we have these weapons. The Blackfoot are a group that, um, if we're able to fight them and defeat them, then we can access those resources. Um, and so for the Blackfoot people, again, having a really strong um, stronghold on, on this landscape, um, when the, that group came, it was just kind of seen as, well, this is obviously a call for war, right? And so it was um, what one elder had said um, was, how did they put it? If, if you're here to fight us, then we'll fight, but then you're not leaving, right? And so from the Blackfoot standpoint, it was like, you, you asked for trouble, now you're gonna get trouble kind of thing. Um, so there, there is a lot of that, that history. Did I answer the questions it feel? Yeah, so um, from, from when the battle had happened, uh, again, with the stories that we have heard, um, anywhere from three to six hundred Cree had come to this area, and from the stories we've heard, three left. Um, of those three that left, they say that two were injured, one died along the way back home, the other two made it home, the one injured ended up dying while they were there. The one survivor um, in the old uh, publications, they do have a picture of him, he was shot in the jaw, and so this part of his jaw is actually missing, so very distinctive, um, very distinctive figure when you see them in pictures. So that was the outcome of the battle there. Hello, uh, my name is Liberty Blair Karasage. I'm currently I'm fighting a cold, so I hope my um, voice is clear, but I guess this is a kind of follow-up question of, I wonder if, um, uh, I just wonder if there's any kind of um, documentation, uh, oral or otherwise, of um, uh, like settler interference um, that kind of came up to this uh, like um, battle 
I think most definitely there would have been indirect kind of interference with like the disease and the dwindling of the buffalo, but and the new technologies. But I wonder, like, in, in a way, would it like would there have been this um, uh, feeling with the settlers of like, oh, let's agitate um, and have a divide and conquer with the um, the First Nations pe uh, like peoples? Is there any um, is there a any evidence uh, for that? I hope that answer. I hope that question is clear. So there is definitely evidence for that, but it's very hard to come by, surprisingly, right? Um, so I have actually in the past seen historical documents of um, some of the Indian agents in this area writing directly to um, Indian Affairs in Ottawa and basically saying, you know, these are some tactics that we can use to divide and conquer the people. So those documents are there, they do exist. They're kept under lock and key, and it's really hard. If you find one, basically like hang on to it because I've, I've heard of some people finding these documents um, and then going back to look for them and they're gone. Um, but yeah, so definitely some of the tactics were, um, like again, removing the food, introducing disease. Um, what, what's interesting with the, the two different types of guns is that here in Canada, um, the closest place to trade was actually in Edmonton, and they would only trade the musket. But we had our um, Scopi Bigani relatives down in the United States, and they were trading with Fort Benton, and Fort Benton was just willingly giving them the repeating rifle. And so it was because that, um, because that, I guess that border cut between our territories, it actually offered us two different um, yeah, they're, they're, they're just, it's really interesting looking at the Blackfoot in Canada versus the Blackfoot in the United States and the different ways that the, the government and the policies affected the different tracks of history that we had gone on. Um, so yeah, that was one thing that they've talked about is that here in Canada, the traders were worried about, you know, a gun is a powerful thing. We should we really be giving these powerful things to the Indian population here? And so even though they did have repeating rifles, they weren't trading them with the Indians here in Canada. My name is Andrew Blair, and uh, I'd like to know if the uh, project has been gathering stories from the Cree side as well as the Blackfoot. <laughs> they don't dare. <laughs> it was one thing that we had discussed, um, and at this point we had said no, we, uh, we felt very strongly that this needed to be Blackfoot focused, um, just because of, you know, the territory that we're in. Um, it's just easier access to, to Blackfoot elders, but this is one thing that we have thought of in the future that we would like to, to pursue and see... Um, what type of stories do do kind of exist in that community? Because in the elders that I have talked to, they have talked about, oh, we've met, you know, like back in the 80s, um, met a Cree, Cree group, and they talked about this battle. And so the way they talk about it too is kind of like a, yeah, maybe we shouldn't have done that. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's something that, it's been posed to us at this point. We said, no, we're making this Blackfoot focus, but that's definitely something that we would look at to the future. My name is Mary Shillington. Thank you very much, both of you, for this. Uh, we moved here in 91 and knew nothing about that. We've always lived in Cree areas, in Saskatchewan, Manitoba. So it's very interesting. We wondered questions about it, and so it was great to hear that and, and to, to know that we'll hear more. Uh, one of my questions is, I have to, uh, one of my questions is, jumping into 20, 2023, uh, what do you see now between the, con is there still ongoing conflict between Cree and, and Blackfoot? We have a Cree daughter, so uh, uh, she certainly feels some. Uh, and the other question is, uh, the scouts are going to uh, running on stone and are going to be seeing, you know, all the, those things on the walls and so on. Have you ever thought about doing some education with those kind of groups? Because I think that would be a, a real good way of, 
um, educating not only we have an indigenous uh, educating indigenous people, but also uh, settlers uh, in a good way. So those are my two questions. <laughs> All right, so I'll answer one question. Um, so the second question you had was really interesting as about uh, the education piece and writing on stone. They've actually expressed a lot of interest ever since we did the drone footage there to find out how, and because, again, deciding how and when this story should be shared and in what way, first through the Galt Museum, but thinking, oh yes, is it, could it be a traveling exhibit? How many other different groups could we share this information at? So yeah, once we took that footage at Reading on Stone, they were very interested in saying, could we perhaps have an exhibit here at Reading on Stone as well, sharing the same story? So it's just a matter of how that happens and, and when, but yeah, definitely we'll be sharing that as soon as we kind of know, once this kind of all kind of concludes. So yeah, it's various phases and various sharing of that knowledge. So yeah. Great question, thank you. Your first question's very heavy and complex. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't answer. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, mm. yeah. I'm here for support. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's one, like, like I had mentioned, historically even, relationships between Blackfoot and Cree are, are complex and it's not just one cut and dry. So I think today that that's still carried over where we have some people in our community um, who have married into Cree communities and either deciding to live there or their spouse is living here. And I've seen um, interactions with those people that they're not hostile. On the flip side, I have seen some really hostile, you know, just not even knowing an individual, but just knowing, oh, they're from that group and kind of having this um, ugly attitude towards them. So really, all I can say is it's individualistic, it's very complex, and it actually comes from a lot of historical trauma that not only Indigenous people, but non-Indigenous people in this country are facing. And I think coming, starting to become aware of it and trying to work our ways through that. So a big thing that I just kind of tell people is like, Moving forward, we just need to be kind and understanding that everybody is almost in some type of level of trauma state, and we're all trying to figure out our own stuff. <laughs> right? so, hopefully, I answered your question. Yeah. Hello, I'm Tanya Weeder. Um, so, I have an interest in cultural VR and its power to. Um, capture and store kind of these historical um, places and spaces and artifacts and that sort of thing. Um, in your project goals, you were talking um, about the power of that immersive storytelling to um, connect with people um, and, some, and contrasting that with traditional ways of storytelling. So I'm curious about two things. One, if you could explain a little bit more about what that experience in VR is and then if you are in your research looking at um, that comparing and contrasting from both um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous participants in VR or if you're focused more on one of those populations. All right, so I'm gonna try and remember your first question. <laughs> Two long questions. So yeah, um, what the virtual reality experience is like when you uh, experience it is that uh, you first step into a field and you actually see a deer, and this deer guides you towards the coolies, uh, where you come, then come into this beautiful coolie area where there are three teepees set up. And so just by gazing at this deer, it actually moves you along into this coolie and the title comes up, The Battle of the Belly River, and then you have the opportunity with three different teepees to either experience the drone footage. So it's like you're in the movie theater within virtual reality where it's a, it's a rectangle, um, but it is that drone footage and it's, it's really beautiful. Um, and then you get to experience that in one teepee, and then you can step out again, you step into a second teepee, and you can see and handle all the different artifacts and you can learn about the different artifacts that were used in the battle. And again, uh, really interesting is we have both examples of that repeating rifle or the single musket um, from trading with Hudson Bay Company, the Cree that they're doing through Edmonton, and then through Fort Benton in Montana with the Blackfoot. 
And it's just interesting, yeah, about the technology differences and having with the two tribes and, and how that was the integral part of that battle. So the, the artifacts are in that second, along with hopefully to showcase that teepee with all of the different uh, war um, uh, pictographs um, being shared on that teepee, as well as some of the actual um, battle instruments that were used and other artifacts from the battle. Um, and then as far as, yeah, the immersive uh, kind of compare and contrast. So um, another Edmontonian, um, Marshall McLuhan, some of you may know, uh, media critic and, and philosopher. Uh, so he came up with the idea the medium is the message. And so this idea, um, so you, whether you're listening to a story on the radio, watching a story on television, uh, reading a story in a newspaper, experiencing it in 360 degrees, in virtual reality, all these different ways you can interact with the story, you have a different understanding of that story based on how you're interacting with it. So this idea of medium theory, again, has been kind of really prevalent from kind of springboarded off that master's research where I keep on looking back at this, this medium theory, do we understand a story differently based on how we're experiencing it? So that's a real focus. I think I answered both of your questions. Did I miss anyone? Um, just if you were um, thinking about that, um, like the participants, are they yes. all Indigenous students or non-Indigenous? Yeah, like how that is. yeah that's a great question. And yeah, um, so the first focus group was Indigenous Career Pathway students from Lethbridge College who were at uh, that <coughs> oral storytelling that happened at Fort Whippa back in October. Uh, there are other members of the community who are also there and they'll be involved in that second focus group and third focus group. Um, and then there's people who are just interested who'd like to participate. And so there'll be these three different kind of perspectives and I look forward to yeah, sharing and kind of separating out how those perspectives change, whether you're from Blackfoot culture or uh, an indigenous student or uh, you just simply were curious. So definitely that is really interesting to me. So yeah, thanks for the great questions. My name is Judy Shepard. Uh, my question is, from what part of the country were these Cree coming uh, to participate in this battle? I'm just curious what, how big their territory was and where they were coming from. Uh, so again, our understanding is that it was um, kind of like a Saskatchewan region that that's where a large group of um, the Cree had come from. And as they kind of moved down south near the border, then that's where the Assiniboine group had then met up with them. Um, and then I believe there was one other group, which I can't recall offhand right now. Um, so yeah, it was kind of like the central Saskatchewan region moving south, picking up a few more groups, and then moving west into, into our area. Sit down yet. <laughs> <laughs> just gonna interrupt. This will be our last question, just for the time's sake. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. It was very interesting. And uh, my name is David Major. But what I'd like to know is, uh, like, yeah, we had these settlers telling the story, and now this is coming. Uh, do you find resistance? Or do you get enthusiastic response from the settlers for you to tell the story? Or are we still trying to tell the story? Uh, you actually <laughs> really interesting questions today. <laughs> um, I've actually, I've, I've experienced a mix. Um, where there are some in the community that are like, you know, oh, this is great, it's about time. Um, and then others that are kind of like, you know, what, what more do you expect to find from this? Kind of like, we found it all, what, what more are you looking for? <laughs> um, so yeah, the, I've, I've kind of experienced the mix, but for the most part, a lot of people are really um, enthusiastic about this idea and very encouraging of it, um, especially people in the community that... Um, I think are um, one just you know kind of honored to be approached and asked for their for their stories to be shared, um, but also I really see a huge sense of pride and honor when they tell these stories, um, because I think for a lot of people in our community, our our identities and who we are is very closely linked to 
the identity of our ancestors and to our past and the stories that are in the past. Um, which again, you know, circles back to so many people saying, oh, my Blackfoot name comes from that battle. And there really is a big sense of pride and like, this is what it is and this is how it relates to that. Um, but yeah, in terms of non-Indigenous community, a lot of them are, are still pretty positive and, and encouraging over it. Okay, so we just have a few minutes left. Um, so if we could just maybe leave um, with Chris and Kanita to come up and maybe give some kind of just last moment um, comments to the group. Um, just take a few minutes to, you know, what do you want people to know before you leave? <laughs> Give me a break, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got to work for my lunch here. Uh, Community did all the hard work. Um, so, yeah, I think the best thing that we can probably learn from uh, hearing about this project and this story today, and it's it's something that uh, definitely I'm learning through this whole process too, is just to have a real great sense of... Uh, respect and understanding of our efforts to move towards truth and reconciliation. And I think the more that we move in that direction, the better off we're all gonna be. Um, and I think um, it's, it's just a real honor for me to be involved in this project, because obviously I have no indigenous background at all. And so working with Kamina has been a real blessing. And uh, it's been uh, just so amazing and impactful to learn about how the story has evolved over time. And again, to make sure that we have all those voices represented. So uh, just making sure that it's a, a respectful story that's told in the best possible way is all we can possibly ask for. And hopefully in the hopes that there's other stories too, historical stories that we can share maybe through this means or not. We'll learn through this if, if this is the right way to go or we should totally, totally go back to the drawing board for, for the next time we, we come upon a story like this. But I think uh, it's been... It's been really special, and I just uh, really appreciate everybody taking time out of your day to, to learn about the story today, guys. It's, it's so fascinating, and it, it's just the fact that it happened right here uh, within the city limits is something that I think more and more people should know about. So, thank you. Okay, well, that con concludes our session here today. Um, you can skip on the screen. Oh, I'm sorry. She has some, some questions, some comments. It's okay. I almost got away with it. Um, so I guess my my comment is more uh, not directly to this project, but kind of spins off from that. A lot of my research um, looking at heritage management. My big argument is that um, Blackfoot people need to be in charge of telling Blackfoot history from our perspective, our voices. Because bottom line, it is a form of self-determination, which is a human right. And so everybody needs to be able to um, practice that. So regardless of what culture they come from, those cultures need to be the ones speaking to those cultural histories and practices. Thank you. Okay, let's do this one more time. All right, so um, that concludes this uh, presentation for today. But you can see up there on the screen, if you need to contact either Kamina or Chris, they have their contact. Um, I'm sure that that's up there so that you're you know, willing to, to reply if anybody gets a hold of you. So, um, just everybody, um, maybe just give these two presenters one last round of applause.